Um, can somebody start recording? There we go. Yep. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Sierra Club Huron Valley Group February program meeting. It's the Valentine edition. We're the Sierra Club and we love this planet. Um, we are the nation's oldest and largest environmental group. Our motto is explore, enjoy, and protect the planet. If you aren't already a member, please join at sierraclub.org. Uh, the Huron Valley Group is the Sierra Club group that represents Washtenaw, Monroe, and Lenawee counties. And my name is Dan Ezekiel, and I'm the program chair for the Huron Valley Group. Let's see. Last month was our first partially in-person Huron Valley Group program in 22 months, and tonight's the second one. You need to be vaxxed, boosted, and masked to attend. We plan on using this hybrid model in the months to come. Uh, sign up to attend either in person or virtual on our meetup page. Um, and let us know what you think about this format. Is it, is it convenient to be able to stay home and watch? Uh, are you excited about coming to in person? Let, let us know uh, how you feel. If you put something in chat, we'll see it. Our chair, uh, Jason is here. Uh, Jason, do you want to say a word to the audience? Here he comes. Careful. Thanks for having us. Great to have Georgia and presentation and Una's uh, amazing tech ability. We're adapting for the second month in a row, so that's super exciting. Um, yeah, that feedback from last month and this month will be really valuable in us trying to figure out how to go forward. And uh, yeah, stay safe, friends. Thanks, Jason. Um, the National Sierra Club will soon be electing its executive committee. Yesterday, our state chapter unanimously endorsed the petition slate, uh, the non-incumbent slate, Aaron Mayer, Myra Koslar, Michael Dorsey, and Kate Bartholomew. You can sign up for an electric an electronic ballot at sierraclub.org or wait for your paper ballot, uh, which is supposed to be here by early March. And we'll put something, we'll put something on the website about who, who the state endorsed. Since you came to see us on a weeknight at the end of a busy day, we like to share some wins. And here's a big win. Uh, some months ago, we had Kathy Tyson, a local veterinarian and anti-wolf hunt activist, present at this program meeting about a proposed wolf hunt here in Michigan. That's because in the waning days of the Trump administration, and I looked this up, it was actually on the day of the election in 2020, the wolf was removed from the endangered species list. Somehow wolf management has become a culture wars issue and the so-called wolf hunts that have occurred in states like Wisconsin have been wolf slaughters with almost 20% of the entire population of was wolf population of Wisconsin being killed in three days. There's been a lot of controversy over whether Michigan should have a wolf hunt and how extensive the hunt should be. The Sierra Club chapter, the State Humane Society and indigenous tribes have been working together to lobby against a Michigan wolf hunt. Last week, Judge Jeffrey S. White in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California set aside the delisting, which means Michigan will not have a wolf hunt this year. Molly Tamulevich, who's the Michigan State Director for the Humane Society of the United States, and incidentally, my former student, uh, said, tears of joy. Thank you, thank you, thank you to each and every person who spoke up across the state and across the country. What a beautiful day. Here's another win. We had another presenter a while back, Sam McMullen, who presented about zero waste. Last week, he spearheaded the city of Ann Arbor's uh, resident race to zero waste week. Hundreds of people gathered virtually uh, to learn and share about breaking our throwaway and landfill habits and creating a sustainable circular economy. 
I was actually at a meeting with Sam today and he said over 500 people participated. Uh, I encourage you to Google resident waste to zero, resident waste to zero Ann Arbor and sign up uh, for the updates. And one of the upcoming, uh, one of the upcoming initiatives from race to zero, which I think is so cool, is going to be the one cart a month club. And it means you only put out your trash cart uh, once a month if you, well, wherever you live, because there's so many other things that you could do to reduce your landfill contribution. In a related win, the city of Ann Arbor has just announced it will extend compost pickup throughout the winter uh, one day per month, the first full week of each month. This is a change many of us have been advocating for for a long time. One direct effect will be to help the Ann Arbor Public Schools develop a composting program, which they have resisted previously because there wasn't compost pickup in the winter months. So next we're gonna talk about the book club. Nancy, you wanna come up and tell us what's up with the book club? Be careful of these cords. Hey, yes, we have a, uh, a book club that uh, runs the uh, second Tuesday of every month from September to May. Um, and right now we've been meeting virtually and it's actually working pretty well. We've had pretty good attendance at them. So uh, that's one good. And the, the one we had for February, which was last week, was um, the book was called Eager and it's about beavers and um, what they contribute to our ecosystem, what it's been like since they were uh, almost wiped out back in the 1800s and how we didn't realize what they actually um, did, for, did for the land and for our watersheds. Um, and people didn't realize that because all the, uh, the wet areas that they produced with their dams um, were disappeared and, and eventually became grazing land or farmland. So that's, that's, uh, that was an interesting book. Um, for March, uh, we'll be reading an updated version of Dave Dempsey's Great Lakes for Sale. Um, it's his original one book was written maybe four or five years ago, and it was clearly in need of updating. So that's, that's what we'll be reading next. And when will that meeting be happening, Nancy? That will be March 8th. Um, this is the easy one to predict. Um, and at uh, 7.30, and it will be online. And it comes out on our, it gets announced on our meetup exchanges. So um, keep an eye out for that. It's also, we usually get them uh, listed in the Ann Arbor Observer. So if you watch that or read that, um, you can look for it in there. I think that's it. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, in December, we give out awards to citizens and officials who have done great things for the planet in the preceding year. One of our awardees wasn't able to make our December or our January meeting, uh, but he's here tonight. So we are going to make a presentation for him and Una is gonna tell you about it. Hello. So, the George Sexton Public Service Servant of the Year Award recognizes the contribution of local government employees and commission members whose efforts have helped protect our local environment. Steve Brown, who nominated John for this award, can't be with us tonight, but he emailed these comments. John Mirsky grew up in Ann Arbor, but left town thereafter to pursue an engineering and management career at Bosch Global, where his management skills were rewarded by promotion to the position of Vice President for North American Operations. 
After his retirement in 2016, he returned to live in Ann Arbor and contribute his energy, skills, and knowledge to address many environmental challenges. His main focus, his major focus has been local action to achieve carbon neutrality. John was a major force in developing the political will to institute the city of Ann Arbor's Office of Sustainability and Innovation and the A20 project. John also helped build the University of Michigan's Voices for Carbon Neutrality and drive the president and regents to begin meaningful action on the university's carbon footprint. John contributes to collective campaigns for zero waste, affordable housing, and public transportation. He has co-founded a land bank to help develop affordable housing, chairs the city's energy commission, and participates in most of the ENGO forums and meetings that are scheduled in Ann Arbor. He walks the talk as well, having fully converted his private property to natural features and an intensive food garden while riding his bike around town as much as possible and pledging to get his home carbon neutral by 2028. So it gives us great pleasure to present John Mursky with the George Sexton Public Servant of the Earth Award. Please come up, John. Woo. Why don't you come, why don't you come around here? And it looks like this. And here you are, sir. And why don't you say something? Good evening, everyone. Uh, Behind this mask is maybe a face that some of you recognize. Uh, I've uh, been living in Ann Arbor since I retired in 2015. And um, I want to say it's been a real pleasure working in the environmental, primarily in the environmental area. Um, there is just a bunch of wonderful people in Ann Arbor that are civically and environmentally uh, active. And all of you are an inspiration for me. And I hope that uh, some of the work that I do can be an inspiration for others. And I really very much appreciate this award because there are so many wonderful uh, volunteers in, in and around Ann Arbor and uh, the greater Southeastern Michigan area. So thank you very much. Good to see you all. And let's talk about next month's program. It's going to be a great one. Uh, TC Collins will be our speaker next month. TC is a black farmer in the Ypsilanti area. He currently has a space in Ann Arbor and is expanding to Apple Ridge Park in Ypsilanti Township. He's both going to cultivate an area where he can continue to farm and educate youth and the local community and a space where residents can grow their own food like a community garden. Tajli Hodge says, TC does amazing work towards addressing food insecurity, not just providing food, but educating on how to grow and cultivate plants and food that will be sustainable for the belly and for the land year after year. That'll be next month, 7.30, right here, and also at this same link. Okay, that brings us to tonight's program. And we have a wonderful presenter tonight. She's a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan. Her name is Georgia Outeri. Uh, she is going to tell us about a ray of hope for bats and white nose uh, fungus syndrome. But we also learned tonight that she's a rock climber and she has climbed uh, rocks internationally. So let me present to you without any further ado, Georgia Outeri. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, let me start my timer real quick so I don't bore y'all. Okay, so Okay, so thank you everyone for coming. So this talk is Good Genes or Just Good Luck, Array of Hope for Bats Facing White Nose Syndrome. So tonight we're gonna talk, um, I'm gonna first go over some basics about bats and then talk about the bats that you all have here in Michigan and then talk about uh, conservation genetics, which is my area of focus. And then more specifically, um, my research on bats and white nose syndrome and then what we all can do to help them. 
Oops, it's a little bit of a lag. Okay. So this is what a bat looks like, a map of the bat. A lot of times people look at pictures of bats and they get a little bit disoriented. So they have these tiny faces here. Um, and then they have these wings as well. And I just realized that uh, actually it's, I'm sharing my screen, but it is not sharing correctly, I think. So give me one second. Yeah, so how to fix this. I think that should be better. All right, cool. So we have a bat's uh, face and then they have these wings, which are basically just extended hands with skin stretched between them. And so a lot of people think that um, bats are similar to rodents, but they are not rats. So they actually reproduce very slowly. So rodents and like mice and rats have a lot of babies, whereas bats um, usually only have one or two babies per year. So they reproduce very slowly. And so this can be the cause for conservation concern. Um, and they're also very different than birds. So there's a lot of things that make them different from birds. For one, it's a lot harder to study them. It's harder to see them and hear them because they fly around at night and they make sounds that for the most part we can't hear. So uh, they're mammals like us, which means they nurse and care for their young. They're slow to reproduce. Like I mentioned, they don't have very many babies. They can be very long lived. So some of the species that we get here in Michigan can live um, to be over 30 years old, not uncommonly. And there's also a lot of different species of bats. So there's over 48 species in the continental United States, nine of which are in Michigan. And bats are, can be really important for humans. They eat um, insects and including insect pests. In other parts of the world, they help um, pollinate plants. And they can also be important for medical research because they have an amazing ability to survive a lot of viruses. So in Michigan, like I mentioned, we have nine species. Um, I'm gonna talk really briefly about these different species with the gray circle, which are what we call cave bats. And then these uh, three species in red circles, which are tree bats. And so these two groups of bats behave a little bit differently. Um, so the cave bats, as you might guess, use caves a lot of the time. So in this picture in the top left, we can see there's a small group of them hibernating together in a cave, but we also have a couple loners. Um, we have this guy by himself. And then we have another bat of a different species by themselves. So cave bats, what distinguishes them is that they spend the winter in caves. That's how they deal with the cold temperatures. But what you might not um, suspect is that they actually leave the caves in summer, at least in Michigan and they disperse out from the caves and go and hang out in forests where they live in dead trees or in bat boxes. There's a group of them hibernating together in the winter. So these cave bats regularly travel actually between caves and forests. Um, and we can see in this map, it's kind of showing a typical distance that some of these cave bats might travel. They usually don't travel more than 500 kilometers. So in this picture, there's a group of them that were banded and tracked and they're traveling from um, the Southern Michigan into hibernation sites in caves in Indiana and Kentucky and Ohio. And they do that every year. So tree bats um, rarely, if ever go in caves. So as you might guess, they spend a lot of time in trees and leaves. And um, they're especially challenging to study because they travel really far distances and they overwinter in dispersed sites like um, in trees, but also in leaf litter in the forest. So this is a bat that's actually burrowed down in the leaves of the forest. And that also offers like a slightly protected area for them to hang out in, in winter. Not as protected as a cave environment, which is why um, they oftentimes migrate farther south than cave bats do. So um, a, couple, a couple of the species that we have in Michigan are the big brown bat and evening bats. These are two different species that basically look pretty much the same. If you have bats that are in your house, it's almost certainly a big brown bat. Um, I always say that big brown bats are like the pigeons of the bat world. And then we have four different species that are all closely related. They're all in the genus Myotis. And here, one of my friends managed to get uh, four of them all together, which is amazing. Um, so the Indiana bat is federally endangered. 
the gray bat is also endangered. Northern long-eared bat was um, listed as threatened because of white nose syndrome, and so was the little brown bat. And uh, most of my research is focuses on the little brown bat, but as you can see, these bats are actually really hard to tell apart. Um, the tricolored bat is another species in Michigan. This one is very small and very cute. Um, they tend to be hibernating alone when you find them in the cave and with, with a lot of water condensation on them for some reason. The hoary bat is a striking species of tree bat. It has this sort of mane here and it has longer fur that's tipped with white like hoarfrost. And the eastern red bat is another tree bat that's very pretty. It's um, color, it has this like reddish coloration and especially the males are actually a brighter color of red than the females. So they have sexually dimorphic coloration like a lot of birds do. And the silver haired bat is a black that's bat, it, or a, a bat that's black and it has silver tipped fur. Um, sometimes if people find this bat, they'll email me and they'll say, oh, I think I found an old bat, it has gray fur. Well, it's just a silver haired bat, they're all like that. Um, yeah, so those are our bats in Michigan. So I started off as a bat lover. I really like studying bats and I thought that it was fun to go out and catch them and get to learn about them. And I kind of say that I'm, um, I begrudgingly got into genetics and doing DNA work. This all sounded like very complicated to me when I first got started, but I did it because I realized that it was really important to learn how to do genetics for conservation work. And this is why. So conservation is ultimately about species dealing with environmental changes, right? Like how do these species survive rapid human caused changes? And evolution is also one way that species can cope with environmental changes. So evolution is therefore really closely tied to conservation outcomes sometimes. Um, so my overarching research focus is at this intersection of when and how can evolutionary adaptation facilitate conservation? This is sometimes called evolutionary rescue, which is a, a growing area of research. So environmental changes can be you know, natural or anthropogenic, human caused. And so some of the human caused environmental changes, which I'm sure you're familiar with, are things like invasive species like kudzu vine in the south, logging, um, habitat destruction of any kind really, and also climate change, which leads to really rapid rates of change, especially at the poles. And this is happening in the context of ongoing natural changes that species have to deal with. So seasonal changes, um, especially at higher latitudes, as well as longer term changes that species have to face, which is like glaciation cycles. You know, Michigan used to be um, largely covered in glaciers. So all of these together is like a lot of environmental change that species potentially have to deal with. So um, some of the conservation out, or some of the conservation problems that can happen because of this environmental change are things like um, population declines, species uh, range contractions, I'm sorry, population declines, so species decreases, range contractions where species might shift its range, as well as um, biodiversity losses where um, we start to lose species. And a couple of ways that evolution, we can have an evolutionary response to this is through natural selection via adaptation. So basically evolving to compensate for the threat but also we can get a lot of random genetic change, which basically if you think of like a genetic bottleneck, that's random genetic change where you're randomly losing a lot of genetic diversity. So this can be quite problematic on the other hand. Um, so you might be saying, well, how can evolution really be fast enough to be relevant to conservation? And um, well, Darwin, it, this comes in part from our perspective. So biologists initially, Darwin came with his theory of um, evolution via natural selection. And biologists were like, wow, evolution. And they started seeing beneficial adaptation everywhere. But um, they thought if a trait existed, it was probably adaptive. And they thought about this in the context of like a new beneficial mutation happens and then natural selection favors that gene, the species evolves. But the thing is genetic mutation is uncommon, especially good mutations are really rare. And so if you think about evolution from that context, it makes sense that you think of evolution as being really slow. But then 
Um, a couple of decades later, some other biologists like Kimura and Ota came along and they said, well, wait a second. There's actually plenty of neutral genetic variation. People have different color hair. They have attached versus unattached earlobes. All these random, um, all this random genetic diversity that, that isn't necessarily adaptive or not. And so the key to rapid evolution is that pre-existing neutral genetic variation might actually end up being adaptive later when the environment changes. So I'm gonna show you an example of that. So imagine these anoles, these lizards on an island. And some of them have normal toes, but some of them have extra long toes, all the same species, random genetic variation, random, random uh, variation in their characteristics. And we're gonna use these two different colors of anoles to represent this, some uh, normal toed red, red anoles and long toed green anoles. So we have our anoles, there's neutral genetic variation, and then the environment changes. A hurricane comes along and a bunch of the anoles get swept away. They're blown out to sea, except for a lot of the anoles with long toes, which were better able to hold on to the trees. And this might seem like a silly example, but this actually happened a few years ago. This is a paper in Nature, one of the um, most prestigious uh, scientific journals. And yeah, they found that just in one catastrophic environmental event, event there was genetic and um, phenotypic trait change in this species of anole. They had longer, grippier toes. I don't know how they measured grippiness, but they did somehow. So two takeaways that I want you to remember about conservation and evolution is that one, natural selection can potentially save species from extinction because their offspring are better adapted. And that means that eventually the population can recover and be better suited to like this particular environmental threat. Um, but two, new, more genetic diversity means better odds of adapting in the future. So better odds of surviving environmental changes like temperature increases, uh, increased storm events, and flooding. And so that is why I'm so interested in environmental changes, evolution, and conservation. So how does this all relate to bats and white nose syndrome? Um, so these bats are facing an a human-caused anthropogenic change. They're facing a new invasive species, a fungal species that was brought over by humans. And um, because of this fungal disease, they experience tremendous population declines. And so the question is, are they adapting to that disease? Are they adapting in the face of that invasive species? And are they um, experiencing a lot of random genetic change because of the population declines they experienced? So for those of who, who don't know what white nose syndrome is, like I mentioned, it's caused by an invasive fungal pathogen. So these are a couple of pictures of it. Um, the top one is zoomed in on the spores of the fungus, which are, have this really characteristic kidney bean shape to them. So I'm told by, by fungal biologists that this is very a unique feature of this fungus. Um, it was brought to North America in 2006. It was introduced in New York from somewhere in Europe or Asia. Spores of this fungus were brought over by accident. It's a fungus that is associated with cave environments. So this fungus only grows in cool, moist environments. And when it gets into those caves, it kills over 95% of the bats in, um, in a lot of the cases. And keep in mind, we have only some of the bats that actually use the cave. So this is like 95% of the cave species of bats. Um, and so what happens is basically the fungus grows on the bat and you can kind of see these white splotches that are uh, happening here. And so on the left, the bats on the left are healthy and they don't have white nose fungus. And then this one on the right does. And so you can see its nose is much whiter than the noses of these other bats. So this is where the disease gets its name, white nose syndrome. And so how the disease impacts the bats is basically the fungus grows on the bat and it's secreting these um, chemicals that like break down the bat's tissues and fats. And it's basically eating the bat alive bit by bit. Um, the bats do not like this. So they wake up from hibernation and clean the fungus off of themselves. And then they go back to sleep. 
and then the fungus grows back and they have to wake up again to clean the fungus off of themselves and so on and so on. And so what ends up happening is that instead of staying in a prolonged deep sleep during hibernation, the bats keep getting woken up to clean the fungus off of them. And um, every time they wake up, it's very expensive energetically. So they end up basically prematurely um, starving to death in the winter or also they have uh, or suffer from dehydration because of this. Basically they're waking up when they're supposed to be sleeping through the winter. And so they run out of fat reserves too, um, too soon to make it through the whole winter. So this is um, some footage from a collection trip where we we're getting some bats. So you might not be able to see, but there's two bats in this picture that are hanging here. They're both dead. Um, and what we do is basically just go and um, collect them. And from those dead bats, we can get tissue samples to see what their DNA looks like, basically. Um, oh, it's just replaying. So some possible ways that these bats might survive white nose syndrome um, from a genetic standpoint. Longer toes aren't gonna help the bats like they help the lizards. So what might help them? Well, they might have, there might be something different about their skin. They might be genetically predisposed to wake up less often to be deeper sleepers, or they might be fatter than the average bat. Um, genetically speaking, they're just, you know, some people tend to, um, be more efficient at saving and storing calories than others. So my question was, are the survivors better adapted? Do we have a situation on, like on the left where there's, there's something genetically different about the survivors? Or is it the situation on the right where some of the bats are surviving, sure, but they just happen to be locked. Um, the years go on, we're gonna continue to see really high death rates because they're not better adapted to the disease. So that was my question. Um, so if the survivors are better adapted, what genes are important that might help us inform how we go about our conservation efforts? And also have we, the survivors lost a lot of their genetic diversity, which might make them less better able to deal with um, additional threats in the future. So to do this, I basically compared the DNA of the dead bats versus the live bats. Um, and I focused just on this species, the little brown bat, which, um, has an extremely wide range, so it spans a lot of North America. And before white nose syndrome, this was the most common species of bat in the eastern United States. And now, um, since the onset of white nose syndrome, it's actually been listed as an endangered species in Canada, and the United States um, was considering listing it, and I it's embarrassing that I don't know. I believe that they ended up listing it as threatened, not endangered. Um, but they listed it in some capacity because of this disease and their populations declining so quickly. So I focused on bats in northern Michigan. This um, map is color coded and basically any county that's a color is someplace where they detected white nose syndrome. And it's colored by year so you can sort of see how every year the fungus is spreading farther and farther um, across the United States. And so I collected dead bats um, from the caves in winter where they were found dead. But I also collected DNA, as I mentioned, from the survivors. And so the survivors were basically adult bats that I found in the summer outside of the caves. And so they're adults, so we know that they survived at least one season of hibernation with the disease successfully. And this is what the sampling looks like. So every, every gold cross or every green star on this map is a bat that I sampled. They're all in Northern Michigan. Um, you can see that the dead bats are mostly in the Western United, or the Western UP. That's where most of their hibernation sites are. Um, if we go back to this map, we can see like, there's not very many hibernation sites in the Eastern UP. Most of the Eastern UP is gray. Um, and then the survivors are relatively more spread out. The green stars are more spread out. But there's also not very many of them. It's hard to find surviving bats. They're just that rare now. And this is what it looks like inside of one of the caves um, where the bats have died. So all of these little circles are circling groups of dead bats. So there's a couple there. There's one more. There's another bat. Um, there's a group of like 
13 or so, five dead bats, four dead bats. Um, and sometimes they even actually fly out of the cave in an attempt to leave because they're starving to death. And so they actually leave the cave to try to go find um, food, to find insects to eat. In this picture, um, this woman's house is just like very close to the entrance of a mine. This is a woman who actually runs one of the tourist mines in the UP. And this is winter, so this is like snow outside. I don't know if you can tell, but she had dead bats hanging from the screens of her house when we went to look at the caves. Um, and so they just basically tried to leave the cave to find food and, and froze to death. So I collected some of those bats as well. Um, and this is the group that we go out with. So Dr. Alan Curto is my master's advisor and Steve Smith was also really fundamental to this. He is um, a mine inspector in the UP and he actually helped track down a lot of these bat hibernation sites um, over the past like many decades. Otherwise we wouldn't know where a lot of them are. And you will note just how high the snow is here if you look at the, at the stop sign. Um, yeah, it's impressive. Steve also drives the snowmobile and I sit on the little sled in the back and get towed around. Um, and then also the rabies lab in Michigan was really helpful for getting samples. So people, if there's just, if they find a bat in their house, they'll often submit it for rabies testing. They don't know if their pet got bit or exposed or something. And uh, the Michigan DNR was really helpful in giving us access to those bats as well. Um, so basically like if a healthy bat, if an otherwise healthy bat was found in someone's house in the summer, um, that I also used that as a sample for some of the survivors. Yeah. Um, so when we collect tissue samples from the survivors, as I mentioned, it's harder to find them. And I'm just gonna show this video here. So this is actually just from this past October. Um, the footage is taken from follow-up work I'm doing, but we're using something called a harp trap. Oops, sorry, the footage is not quite working how I want it to. Yeah, so this is in Missouri. Um, and basically how this um, harp trap works is that there's a bunch of really thin strings stretched out like a harp and the bats fly into them and the strings cause their wings to collapse and then they fall down into the bag that's underneath the trap there. And so this is a really good way of catching um, bats that happen to be outside of a cave entrance. So these bats, this is actually in the fall, like I mentioned, October, and these bats are trying to get back into the cave to hibernate for the winter. And um, you can see like some of the bats crawling around in the trap and stuff. And when you look at a bat, you can, um, we can get measurements on like their size, obviously, but also things like looking at their wings to see if their wings are healthy. Like, is there evidence of scarring from the white nose fungus on their wings? Um, because the fungus will actually eat holes away in their wings. And so you can tell later if there's, um, if they've like been exposed to a lot of the disease potentially and stuff. Sometimes by October, they've healed, their wings have healed enough, but sometimes you can still see scarring. Yeah, so this is just to give you an idea of, of what it looks like to go out and catch bats. Um, we store them in bags just temporarily. We don't ever hold onto the bats for longer than an hour because we don't want to like detain them too long. They're, you know, out there trying to get food and mate and do whatever. They have like bat business to do. Um, but you can see we work in teams. So there's probably people from like, several different universities here, as well as Fish and Wildlife Service and um, the Missouri Department of Conservation. This is weighing a bat. And yeah, so we all kind of coordinate our efforts at once. That way we're not like disturbing the bats a bunch of different times. Um, we're just kind of all going at once, one night when they have to put up with us. And then this is what it looks like when we take um, a DNA sample from the bat. So we basically take a little hole punch from the wing and uh, you can look and see where the veins are and avoid them and stuff like that. And uh, we take a hole punch and then this will heal in one to two weeks actually. So they, their wings heal like very quickly from this. And then just using that tiny little bit of tissue, 
we can get the DNA we need to do these analyses. And so afterwards, um, we let the bats go, they fly away. Obviously, they're, the survivors are potentially very important, right? Especially if they have good genes, we want them to be going out there and flying away and reproducing and you know, getting back to their life. Um, so um, the DNA sampling, I think I'm gonna skip over this, but basically we like fragment the DNA up and for my research, I basically, I looked at a random 1% of the bat's DNA. We don't have, it's very expensive to look at all of the DNA for every bat. So I randomly looked at 1%, the same 1% for every bat. And then um, we can, if for the genes that are important, we can map that back to the bat genome. And we do know something about like the function of a lot of these genes because um, the function of genes doesn't change that much between mammals. Okay, so um, I'm gonna show you some, this is gonna be the most complicated part of the whole talk. So in this slide, every dot basically rep represents a fragment of DNA. And the bottom uh, x-axis that goes horizontally along the bottom is just the DNA position. So there's different colors. Those are kind of like showing different uh, chromosomes. They're different like sort of locational clusters of DNA. And the important thing is just basically the higher up the dot is, the more, uh, the more differentiated that gene was between the survivors and the dead bats. So if a dot was like all the way as high as it could be, that would mean that all the survivors had one version of a gene and all of the dead bats had a different version. And so what we found was um, we decided like, like these genes that were really high up were pretty interesting to us. And, but we don't know what all of them do, right? We don't know even in humans what every single gene does. And so for uh, only for three of them, were we able to say something about what the function of the gene was. So I'm gonna talk about each of these three, starting with this GABA RB1. And so basically um, this gene, this first important gene was part of an intercellular receptor for this, um, this, this intercellular transmitter called GABA. And this is basically a neurotransmitter that's evolved in arousal from hibernation. So this is basically part of a gene that helps the bat know when to wake up. And this gene is actually in humans responsible for like when we wake up just from sleeping is very similar function. Um, the second gene, SIGINT PK1 is actually involved in lipolysis pathways, which is just a fancy way of saying it's involved in breaking down fat. And it's um, variants of this gene are actually associated with obesity in lab rats. So it looks like um, the survivors are probably genetically predisposed to be a little bit heavier. And then this final gene um, is actually involved with bat echolocation calls. It's a gene that in humans, FOXP2, it's a gene that in humans is actually associated with speech. In birds, it's associated with bird song. Um, so this is really interesting because it's the most important gene apparently. But this one, it's a little bit less clear why it would be what like this, what version of it the survivors would have that would be beneficial. Um, bats do have social calls and communicate with each other vocally like we do. So maybe it leads to differences in um, socializing. Like maybe it's better to be a loner in the cave and be far away from all the other bats that are waking up or something like that, but we don't know for sure. Uh, so in summary, um, remember that white nose syndrome kills bats by causing them to wake up too often from hibernation and dying of physio physiological complications like um, starving to death, basically. And look what we find. We find that the survivors um, have genes that potentially help them wake up less often or and um, give them higher fat reserves. So the genes basically make sense in the context of what we know about how the disease works. And right after uh, my paper came out, a couple other scientists came out with papers saying basically the same thing. They found that um, in other parts of the country, they, they looked at the same species in other parts of the country and found that the survivors have different versions of some genes. So it looks like um, the survivors aren't just lucky, but they're genetically better adapted. In the case of our bats in Michigan, they're fatter and better at sleeping, which means that they're more likely to make it 
um, until spring. But unfortunately, um, we have the other part of the evolutionary puzzle, right? We have, are the bats, um, are they losing genetic diversity? And what I want you, I'm just gonna, what I want you to take away from these two plots is basically the survivors in green um, have undergone a lot more genetic drift, meaning that now they have they've gone a lot, they've undergone a lot more losses in genetic diversity, and they now have lower genetic diversity. So this plot on the left um, is showing like this is the main axis. PC1 is this main axis of genetic variation, and they're much lower on the axis they're towards the left. And um, the bats that died are overall much more genetically diverse. They have more genetic variation. They're over towards the right. And then I directly estimated the amount of drift. And so in this, um, in this plot on the right, each dot is representing like a whole population. And so the survivors as a population just have a lot more genetic drift. They have a much longer line compared to the ones that are, um, the ones that died are more similar to like the inferred pre-disease population. So um, it's a bit of good news and bad news when it comes to these bats. So I wanna highlight real quick that it's not just about DNA though, and it's not just about um, the bat DNA. So an undergraduate who was working with me um, noticed that actually when we look at the bat DNA, like before we filter it just for bat DNA, we actually get a lot of other DNA. So this is a whole list of different species of microbial DNA that we picked up in the bat samples. And she noticed, in fact, that there's even a couple of species in here that are microbes that have known antifungal properties. So these are two different species of bacteria, Pseudomonas fluorescens and uh, Rhodococcus, that have actually been shown in the lab to fight and kill the white nose fungus. And so um, this undergraduate, Olivia, she wanted to know, okay, um, are high but naturally occurring levels of these antifungal bacteria also associated with lower levels of the white nose fungus? Like, is there differences in your skin microbial community that is allowing bats, some bats to survive? And so if that's the case, we would expect that for, um, for the white nose fungus DNA, we would say, so the white nose fungus is always on the Y axis, and then the good bacteria is always on the X axis down here. We would expect that there would be an inverse relationship, right? That the more of this good, bac good bacteria you have, um, the less of the white nose fungus that you have. And if you squint, that's kind of what she found actually. So, um, so it's basically not just about the bats DNA, it's also about the other things that are going around in the environment, what other microbes they're exposed to and stuff like that. So this is all very, very promising. So I'm um, in my future research, I'm planning to build on this in a few different ways. I wanna get a better idea on how much genetic diversity was lost by looking at museum specimens, I also want to see if other species of bats are evolving in response to the disease. And I want to know if, um, multi if other populations of bats are evolving. I only looked at ones in Michigan. So one way to get at how much genetic diversity was lost um, was to add, is to add another group of bats, basically. Add a pre-disease group of bats. And we can do that, um, as I mentioned, by looking at museum specimens. So um, all across the United States, there are bats stored in museums like this. So these are dried specimens. They were collected many times, um, oftentimes decades and decades ago before people were ever really doing DNA work. But even then you can actually get usable DNA from this dried museum skin. Um, and even from their bones too. Our, our genomic techniques are advancing more and more. So I sampled um, bats from museums to see like, what did, the, what did the disease look like before, what did the bat population look like, excuse me, before white nose syndrome? And a lot of other people are also really excited about this idea. So this is, um, all of these museums have sent me 
bat tissue samples now from dead bats that they had in their collection. Um, and a lot of other organizations have gotten on board too. And so that is gonna help us really be able to say, well, you know, let's not just, let's not only look at the good, let's not only look at the fact that bats are adapting, let's make sure we know like how much genetic diversity was lost. Um, so for then considering what other species are doing in response to white nose syndrome, the next species I want to focus on is the gray bat for a couple of reasons. One, um, United U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is right now having to make a decision about whether to keep the gray bat as listed as endangered or to take it off the list. And so a big part of that question is um, how badly are they doing in the face of white nose syndrome? The, the gray bat, for, for clarification, was an endangered species before white nose syndrome came around. So that is not in its favor. We're going to say, oh, well, it was endangered already, so it can't be doing that well now. But on the other hand, gray bats are actually um, naturally quite fat. I don't know if you can tell from this picture, but this, to me, I look at it, I'm like, wow, that's a fat bat. So they're naturally a little bit fatter than the other um, similar species of bats. And so they might actually be set up to deal with white nose syndrome a little bit better. And this is, as I mentioned, in conjunction with Fish and Wildlife Service, um, especially Vana Kaczynski, who they're very interested in this question. Um, and then some other species are also doing well. So evening bats have actually been expanding in Michigan. Um, and also Wisconsin and some other adjacent states. And part of this is because for some reason that we don't know yet, they actually don't die as much from white nose syndrome either. So one of the things um, that we think might be happening is that basically as the other bats die, this species is like, hey, more food for me, more trees for me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on up. Um, so these are both like just small papers that I had um, you'll notice back to back 2015, new, new records of evening bats in Washtenaw County. We're at the northern edge of their range here. They're this species is expanding the limit of their distribution. And then just a year later, um, a new record breaking um, occurrence in Michigan as well. So the species is on the move. Um, and then finally, looking at different populations. Um, white, this is you know, just reminding us of how extensive white nose syndrome is and how far it's spread. It was actually, it's been detected in some counties on the west coast of the United States now. So it, it is kind of getting everywhere. So it's important to know, are all of the populations adapting? And if so, are they doing so in the same way? Okay, so just in the last few minutes, I wanna talk about what we all can do to help bats. I think that this, I suspect that this is a prime group of people who are interested in taking action to help bats. So one thing um, is planting native plants. I heard some talk of that before the meeting started. Um, so native plants better support native species of insects and insects are what bats eat, at least here. All of the species of bats we have in Michigan are insect eaters. So, um, you know, supporting a healthy backyard um, and pollinators in, includes helping bats. And of course, uh, going along with that is avoiding insecticides and things like that, which could also, you know, make its way into the bat through the food that they're eating. And then having hydric habitats. So water is really important for bats, especially open water. Um, they drink on the wing. So they need some place that um, where there's not a lot of trees and bushes around, and there's also not a lot of duckweed or things like that. So they can just kind of skim and grab water um, from the surface. And this is often for, especially for bats that are raising young, this is the first thing they do when they wake up at night. They wake up and then they fly sometimes a couple miles to wherever like an open water source is. Um, yeah, so these are just some pictures of showing what that looks like. So the bottom picture is like good water for a bat, but this top left picture with the rifles in it, for whatever reason, bats hate like rippling streams. The noise actually interferes with their echolocation, I think, so they avoid them. And then this other picture on the right, um, that's just, it's too cluttered of a habitat. There's all these sticks and branches in the way, and it's actually pretty hard for a bat to navigate around them. So they probably wouldn't like that either. Um, and then shelter is the other big thing for bats. So 
Like I mentioned, all species of bats use trees for some part of the year. The cave bats especially tend to like dead trees and tree hollows. And um, you can put up bat boxes, which are basically mim mimicking a tree cavity. So what happens is a lot of times um, people obviously don't want dead trees near their houses. They might fall, it's a liability. So a bat box is a good alternative. Um, you just need to make sure that they're up high enough, at least 15 feet, so that the bats feel safe from predators. And then especially in Michigan, you want it facing towards the sun, basically. Bats, especially mom bats raising babies, want it to be really warm inside. They want a warm environment, even in the summer. Um, you want you know, something that's not gonna degrade like pine or cedar, and it has to be open underneath for quite a ways. So that way they can sort of drop down and swoop out of the box. And they also like to have different options in the same area. So just putting up one bat box is great, but what the, what the bats really want, especially moms with babies, is they wanna have a few different options within the same area. That way they can spend one night in one bat box and then they can move to another one a couple of days later. This helps them avoid predators. And it also helps them, um, if the boxes are positioned a little bit differently, then they can choose one that's gonna be the right temperature. So maybe one gets too hot sometimes, it tends to run a little warmer than, than other boxes, for example. Um, and then also things like, of course, respecting the caves, not entering the caves in winter and waking up bats. Um, and you know that helps also not spread the white nose fungus around. I was actually a bad kid. I would, um, in high school, like illegally, like go into caves I wasn't supposed to and stuff. I didn't know at the time. I didn't think about the animals and stuff inside, but now I know. And so I tell other people. And of course, helping to educate others, um, donating where you can, vaccinating your pets for rabies. I think of all those bats submitted to the DNR for rabies testing each year, a thousand bats a year that they kill to test for rabies to see if someone's pet is in trouble or not, or some person is in trouble or not. Um, so avoiding exposure is important. Uh, so some suggestions for future reading. Is, I heard that you have a book club. So uh, Emily Monosen, she has this book, Unnatural Selection, about how we're changing evolutionary pressures on species. And she actually has an upcoming book on killer fungi about, um, about problematic fungi that are causing problems for wildlife and also agriculture, I believe. And so she actually interviewed me for this upcoming book and I've read the final draft of the chapter on bats and white nose syndrome. So she did a really good job of pulling together research from like a lot of different people. Um, and then there's this mental floss article that's just on my work, but then uh, fairly recently a National Geographic article came out on white nose syndrome that similarly talks to you know, all the people that were looking at evolution in bats to white nose syndrome and like combines that story into one. And I do a weekly live stream. So if you like hearing me talk, you could hear me talk every Wednesday if you wanted to at four on the Humans and Wildlife Show, which I co-host with um, my friend, Dr. Christian Sase, who's a, an eagle photographer. And these are just some of our most recent episodes. The one last week was actually on discovering new species. And we talked to someone who's described um, several new species of grasshopper. So uh, yeah, so with that, I'd like to say thanks to um, all these different organizations that gave me money. Genetic sequencing is not cheap. Um, all these different people that helped me find bats, either for the work I talked about or upcoming work. And with that, I will take any questions, um, if I can get back to the Zoom. Oh, yeah. And you can put the questions in the chat as well. Yes. That's a really good question. So um, Una, that's your name? Sorry. Una asked if there's any information on the bats where the fungus is from. And um, so yes, there is. And basically bats in Europe and Asia, they don't die because of this fungus. The fungus like grows on them a little bit, but like it's, it doesn't cause noticeable deaths. They seem to tolerate it quite well. So basically they've been co-evolving with the fungus for a long time. Yeah, but there are people that are studying like 
you know, how do those bats cope with it and things like that, yeah. Um, there's another question from Erica, is white nose syndrome affecting bats in Austin? So the white, the fungus that causes white nose syndrome has made it to some areas pretty far south. Like it is, I believe, I'm almost positive it's in Texas. Um, but so far people haven't noticed bats dying there because of it yet. And so it might be that because the winter is shorter and it's a little, the climate is a little bit warmer that they're just not gonna experience deaths at the same level or at all, because it's like, well, even if they wake up more often, they still have enough fat to make it through the winter because the winter is short. Yes. Uh, two questions. Two questions, okay. You showed a slide that if I understood correctly, showed that the bats that were surviving white nose syndrome had less genetic diversity than bats who were succumbing to the virus. Yeah. Is, is that bad news going forward in terms of being able to survive future viruses, future whatever changes in climate, um, all these things that are impacting uh, ecosystems and, and nature in general? Yeah, definitely. So the question was whether the bats that um, have, you know, it's given that one of my findings was also that the survivors have less genetic diversity. Is that bad news for bats going forward in terms of, you know, being able to adapt or survive other viruses, et cetera? And that's exactly correct. So that's one of the things that um, is potentially worrisome. Like it, it might mean that you know, bats are less set up to evolve again in response to a new threat. And it may even mean that you know, some of that genetic diversity that we lost was important. So maybe the remaining bats, um, you know, they might not like reproduce, they might not have as babies as often or something like that. Um, there might be problematic trade-offs that we're not seeing yet. No. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, so the question was, do we know, like, given that they have lower genetic diversity now, like, do we know if that's because of the disease or if that was pre-existing? And so the first answer to that would be that because the ones that died, like most of the bats die from the disease, right? And they have higher genetic diversity. So they're almost reflective of the genetic diversity before the disease. Because we, we, we can basically see like, oh, collectively there was a lot of genetic diversity and now there's not very much. Um, but being able to confirm that is one of the reasons I want to look at the museum specimens from the past. It's basically like a window into the past from before the disease. Um, yeah, and then the other part, the other reason I think they had high genetic diversity beforehand was um, because they were such an abundant species beforehand. It's not a guarantee, but it's like, oh, well, probably, yeah. Did you have a second question? I have a second question, uh, and I'll put it into context. Uh, when I was young, about 10, uh, my family visited Carlsbad Tavern and saw the bats fly out at night. <laughs> and then um, my wife and I went there just a few years ago, and the bat population had dropped dramatically. Mm. Um, that's fairly remote, but I assume is, is, is are there viruses? There was one question about Austin, are there mm -hmm. other viruses or what are, what are the other kinds of things that are impacting that population other than say um, just, um, human development of properties and things like that? Yeah. Insect, in, insect lines are also happening too. Is that another major? Right, yeah. So the, the overview of the question was like, are there other things that are causing bat population declines? And at least in North America, the answer is not really. Maybe insect declines or pesticides. Um, we actually don't have really good like long-term monitoring of bat populations. Um, wind energy facilities are actually very 
potentially problematic for some of the tree species of bats. For some reason, they're actually, they actually seem to be attracted to the turbines. Um, and they actually, like many more bats, die at these turbines than, than uh, birds do, actually. Um, but the, in, natural, in a natural sense, like bats actually have very low death rate. That's part of why they don't need to have so many babies um, is that they don't have high predation. They don't have high like disease fatality and stuff like that, at, at least in this region of the country. There's also a question from Chandra. Do the surviving bats fully recover or do they just deal with this each winter? That's a great question. We don't really know. Um, so certainly their skin fully recovers, their skin regrows, but it's like, yeah, maybe um, they're not able to make up like as much fat reserves as they need or something like that, like because they're coming out with lower fat. So that's one of the reasons that I try to encourage like bat boxes and native plants and stuff, because for the bats, for these bats suffering from white nose syndrome, what happens in the summer actually matters. What happens when they're potentially all in your backyards and stuff like that, like being able to recover is potentially a really key part. And uh, also a question from Carol, is there evidence that where there's more food the, for the bats, there's lower fatality? Um, so a group of other researchers did a study where they actually created what they call a bat buffet outside of the hibernation sites. They shine these really bright lights to attract insects. And then they showed, I don't know if they showed lower, that there was lower deaths, but they did show that like the bats got fatter or something. Um, but if you look up like bat buffet, you'll find this stuff where, yeah, people are, there's, there's some concern that we're also, that you're kind of creating a death trap for the bat by doing that because then the owl, it's really easy for owls and predators to find them. So it's, it's under investigation. Yes. Um, so I know a lot more about birds than I know about bats. And I know with birds, they are often banded. So we know what happens to individual birds over time. And what got me thinking about that was, was Donna's question about do the bats fully recover. Do you ever tag or ban individual bats to find out what happens to them over time? Yeah, um, we do. The, the, recover, the band recovery rates are much lower for bats. And by that, I mean, like when we put a band on a bat, we are almost certainly never going to find, no one is ever going to see it again, which makes it difficult. Um, but we actually, I should have mentioned this. We, it is sort of, you can kind of find them if you go back to the same cave each time, find the bands. And so we actually had um, a publication from a couple of years ago where we found some banded bats at a hibernation site in Michigan. And one of the bats, a couple of them were in their 20s. I think one was in its 30s. And so the title of the paper is Bats Can Survive to be old, basically, even in the presence of white nose syndrome. Are they still having babies? I don't know, but they, they can keep going at least for some years, yeah. Um, and for context, white nose syndrome has been in Michigan since 2014 now. So those bats lived at least like five years with it or something probably. How can you tell how old a bat is, Carol asks. Um, you can't tell that well. Basic, if we don't have a band, we can basically say, oh, this bat was born in the last like six months or so, or it's an adult. Those are like our options for aging them, yeah. Yeah, well, it looks like there's no other questions. I'll hand it over, thank you. Yeah, let's, let's please have some appreciation uh, for Georgia. That was, that was wonderful. And uh, I'd like to say a few years ago, we had a presentation about white nose. And I think it was from your mentor there at Eastern. And the situation was just so unrelievedly bleak. <laughs> it, there was just no ray of hope. And then I, I just happened to be scrolling one night and I saw your research and I said, oh, a ray of hope. Okay, we're gonna have, we're gonna have her come. And obviously it's a mixed, it's a mixed bag and, and to coin a phrase, the bats are not out of the woods, but uh, at least there is some hope that we'll continue to, to see bats in the, in the evening in our backyards. Um, thanks, for, thanks for all the 
um, wonderful uh, information that you shared with us. Um, everybody stay safe. Come back and come back and see us next month when we have TC Collins talking about his uh, journey and preserving his farm. You're getting some very nice. Uh, you're getting some nice reviews here, Georgia. I hope you. I hope you can see them. All right. Good night, everybody. Stay safe.